Buenos días. Good morning. Very good, Chris. Good. <laughs> like always, we have interpreting into Spanish. So if you see people who might need it, please send them our, in our direction by the door. Hay alguien esta mañana que necesita interpretación al castellano, español, castilla o como le quieran llamar. Levante la mano. Okay. Muchas gracias. Buen día. Now with us, Miguel Robles. Let's hear from from you all. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to start today in este, I don't know if you just read my welcoming letter. Did you have a chance? No. OK. I invite you to read it. I, don't wanna, I am not going to read it now. But I was questioning if we are ready to really, really break free from fossil fuels. And did you read the Project Drawdown book this year, the new book? Project Drawdown from, by Paul Hawkins? No? How many of you read it? Can you raise your hand? I think we all were, were a little shocked about the, the, main, the main problem that we have with fossil fuels, that is the, the use of oil for fridges and cooling systems, right? Many people was more focused on cars. And well, what I, I was questioning in this welcoming letter is if we are ready to, to turn the fridge off. How many of you use a fridge in your kitchen? And how many of you don't need a fridge in your kitchen? Can you raise your hand? Sally, you don't use a, a, a fridge? You use or you don't use? OK, but who don't use a, a, a fridge in their kitchen? Can you raise your hand? or a cooling system. So I, I mean, what, what I would like to know if we are ready to, to, to confront this challenge of turn off our fridge off. Would you do that? Because that, that's the main problem, you know, that we are here and, and we are trying to change things the, the way they are. But we, it's very hard sometimes to, to commit to do something like that because it's not normal, no? But if we are living the, in the, the, the new normal, is abnormal in, in terms of what we learned from the past, like the hurricanes that now are happening in the, West, in the East Coast that are terrible and that are not normal to happen in, the, in New York or in New Orleans, in Houston. We also have to live in a different normality that, that is what we, until now, have been living, no? And, and I think this, this new reality has to, to be changing our lifestyle. Like, for example, if we can turn the fridges off, if we can stop driving, if we really, really do what we believe that is the best for the planet. But I don't know how many of us can, can take that challenge and, and, and say, OK, I'm going to do it, you know? I, I think that is really, really hard because we grow up with this. And I personally, I don't drive. I have never driven in my life. I cannot drive. My grandfather was a cab driver for 40 years in Mexico City in night shifts. And I don't know. I think he already polluted enough that I cannot pollute anymore, you know? So I ride my bike all the time. I, I have never flown in a, in a plane, you know? And, and I am not really young, you know? So, and I don't, I don't wanna say that I am pure or something like that. It's just maybe an accident that I hate cars. I don't like engines, you know? But I wonder how many people, if I have survived my, their, my whole life without a car or without flying, I don't know if people who are used to, to drive or to, to fly, if they could stop, if, you, if they could reverse the, the impact that they, the, 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 the way they are impacting the, the planet. 
You know, I don't know how many of you have been thinking in changing radically some things in, in your lifestyle. Can you raise your hand? You? But you can buy the most expensive car. You can buy the most expensive car. <laughs> and you don't have a car. No, actually, I always see Theo, and she has very comfortable shoes. And it's super light the way she walks, you know. I have been walking with her to the bar station. She just had a surgery on her knee, and she was not driving, you know. So I, I think there is the, 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 that is the main problem, that we are, we are not afraid to, really not afraid to hurricanes or climate change or droughts or, or heat waves. We are more afraid to change our lifestyle. You know, and, and I think that is the, the, the main problem. But you know, I'm gonna stop this rant and I'm gonna invite Theo to, to come. And Theo has an amazing presentation, but it's not just Theo. Today is gonna be amazing. And I would like to mention a couple of the presentations that I, well, I, I cannot say anything about just one, but all of them are amazing. And I hope you really enjoy today. And Theo. So good morning. Good morning. good morning. good morning. Come on, one more time. Good morning. good morning. This is the final day of the 2017 Soil Not Oil Conference. This is the day where we have the opportunity of sharing some solutions and some opportunities. And Miguel started it off. He started it right off. Jeez. You know, can we do without a fridge? Can we do without a car? Can we do without flying? And you know, I mean, bottom line is maybe eat meat, you know, one day a week. Maybe, I mean, you know, just whatever it is, it makes a huge difference. So I'd like to invite my panel up and um, just share a couple of overviews about what this, what I've learned so far in this wonderful event and what we propose to engage you in today. I learned a couple of things that, you know, are just fundamental to my core. The beautiful young woman, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, uh, who uh, Diana brought, who's the shepherdess, told me about a fluid the seas of our land, the flock of herds, <laughs> a flu, a flurd. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. And that they're ecological doctors, those shepherdesses and shepherds, because basically the way that the land is vital is the stomping of those hooves on the land to make the rhizomes and the mycelia just go, ooh, ooh, we've got it going on, because actually they do. <laughs> so there's some issues today that we're going to kind of pay attention to. I heard that leases of three to five years for farmers were attractive. I, I actually challenge that. I think with all the dignity and respect that we need to offer our farmers, we need to enable them to they have the opportunity to access to agricultural land and grow their families, their lives, and their livelihood as they grow our food. So that means community land trusts. So community scale activities are being invited. As so eloquently said by Kari Hockmeyer, the farmer and activist yesterday, we need to support these high cost, high risk, professionals and enable choices and solid returns on investment for both the farmers and the community in which they farm and that requires that they own, the farmers own their, their land. Now there are many ways to have that happen and that will be addressed. We do agree that we all need to grow flowers for our pollinators and then to celebrate the beauty of our lives uh, and not experience Roundup rain. 
It's a scary thing. So we in this panel are honored to present issues and practices that we address and ways to be and live going forward. Our first presenter is Kendra Johnson, who is a um, uh, access, uh, she's a, a land access professional, long range farmer, access to resilient agricultural base. She addresses loss of agricultural farmland, uh, farm succession crisis, lack of land access and cost to farmland. And then Eric Mathis, Climate Change 3.0, the Emerging Regenerative Economy. And then Stuart, who is with us from Michigan, will tell us about the Community Cultural Food Shed Resilience Program. And then most important, our final activity is to open it up to questions to you. So with that, I'll bring up Kendra. See this while I'm talking. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Theo. Thank you for this challenge. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Let's. Do I have a clicker? Oh, I can do that. I'll do it. What's that? Great. So this is um, me at age 23 farming on an acre right over the hill here in Moraga, standing in our spring cover crop with my friend Sarah. Um, I left that, that was the funnest thing I ever did. Um, did that for four years and left partly because of the lack of um, secure land access and uh, any long-term um, ability to be there. For a resilient food economy to be possible, we must address the health of our soils, the future of family farming, and the distribution of land. We continue to lose agricultural land at a rate of 40 acres per hour in the US. Um, some of, in, here in California, some of our very, the world's best and deepest soils are uh, disappearing to development all the time. This is not new to you. Um, Farmland is lost to real people, too, due to structural inequities. The work of the Land Loss Prevention Project in the Southeast is um, addressing the uh, terrible losses of land to black family farmers there. So this is people, who, not just our landscapes, that are um, in peril. Um, whoops. Family uh, farms are being consolidated quickly. The largest. 4% uh, of American farms now use well over half of our farmland. Um, most of the, a lot of that's not really actually growing food. Uh, the number of large farms is growing, the number of very small farms is growing, but the mid-scale family farms, those ones that are commercially viable um, and that are the pillar of regional food systems are disappearing. It's much like the economic middle class. I think we need to be really concerned about this. Farms are losing ground. Um, and farm succession. This is a crisis. We, you know farmers are getting older. A third of all U.S. farmers are 65 years and older now. And the attrition rate of beginning farmers is very high. Um, former farm workers, uh, farm managers, farm employees who um, could, uh, would probably be the obvious candidates to take over some of these family farms whose kids are no longer um, interested, face tremendous structural barriers to uh, financing and to um, land access, to taking over these uh, businesses. And so continuity is becoming, is very, very hard for us to um, maintain. So what's going to happen to these 400 million acres that are due to change hands in the next 20 years? Uh, most of it is expected to be passed down to family trusts to largely non-farming heirs. A lot of it is continuing to be swallowed up um, by large-scale corporate agriculture 
or bought by outside investors. I'm sure Anuradha talked about this last night. I was really sorry to miss her. Um, that little tiny slice of ag land that might go on the market for sale to new entry farmers is not affordable. How many of you know a farmer who has either had to go out of business or move because they couldn't afford the land they were on? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, very concerning when we don't have access to a land base for the people who we rely on to steward our landscapes. Per acre farm values are um, c continuing to rise um, beyond the capacity of farmers to produce um, incomes. Rural residential land buyers are outbidding farmers. And housing. Farmers can't even afford to housing, as Katie pointed out yesterday, to live where they work. So the free market itself, as Stewart has pointed out, is creating this problem. It won't solve it. How must we, as individuals, as communities, as institutions, begin to invest and reinvest in a viable agricultural land base? First of all, farm viability, right? All of us, the eaters, get to participate by putting our money where our mouths are. So thank you, and I think you're all doing this. Um, so farm succession, the, the importance of continuity can be addressed partly by investing in uh, land and farm linking programs, right? Br bringing the, the older generation and younger generations together, helping smooth transitions, uh, beginning farmer training programs like Brittany's um, concept of shepherd, bringing a shepherding school to the US. I love that too. Um, and then some creative succession thinking of, about continuity. This man, Jeff Main, uh, invested in growing a farm for a whole, his whole adult career and realized that um, as he looked forward to retirement, as most farmers rely on their land um, as their retirement, that um, as soon as they decided to sell that land, the market would do its job very well and good humus would cease to be a farm. Uh, it, the highest and best use of 20 acres in the Cape Bay Valley is uh, maybe a pony ranch or a real estate, right? So um, Jeff and Annie want to continue their farm to continue to mature and to sustain future generations of farmers. We're going to talk about what they did in a, in a moment. Uh, there are lots of ways to invest political will um, and financial resources in agricultural land conservation, um, planning tools, mitigation policies, conservation easement programs like the Sustainable Ag Lands Conservation Program here in California that Renata talked about yesterday, um, support for regional uh, land trusts and public agencies, and local efforts. Um, in the Davis and Sacramento um, regions, the, the food co-ops there got together with Jeff and Annie Main and said, we really care about the farms that are sustaining our own co-ops and our member bases, and we will raise money to protect our, these small, otherwise unpreservable family farms that we care about and want to have access to in future generations. Um, we must not stop thinking about farm preservation as land preservation alone, but rather start to address the issues of affordability. Um, income diversity, we know, is very important to healthy urban communities. The same is true of rural communities. It's time to start applying affordable housing tools in rural areas. One of the ways we, are, we can do this is through a community land trust model. Um, um, also, there are ways to provide incentives for owners to sell um, their land or to pass on land to next generation farmers that I don't have time to go into right now. Um, and, and, um, and the community land trust model is beginning to take hold. This is where a community would own a piece of agricultural land, a whole working farm, and lease it long term to a farmer with the option for a lifetime's worth of work and equity in the buildings and soil improvements and infrastructure. Um, and then there's finally a way that, that farmers can continue to own land um, on protected farms that have provisions for um, a continued agricultural stewardship and affordability. So the good humus easement is a whole farm approach. 
Um, this goes beyond the scope of a traditional agricultural easement to ensure that um, the sale price of that farm would be limited to its farm value, that only a qualified farmer, farmers could purchase a, a farmer, a bona fide farmer could um, qualify to purchase that property um, and must live there and farm there and adhere to basic stewardship standards as determined by the land trust and the um, owners at the same time. So this project is uh, wrapping up and we're really excited to um, soon set, um, uh, add to the precedent in California for a, an unusual approach to farm preservation. So again, how do we invest creatively in land ownership by farmers and ranchers? Um, how do we redirect capital into regenerative, regenerative farming and um, help tilt the balance of ag land distribution back towards the smallholder? It's time to do this. Uh, we have small community efforts. Um, uh, the farmers on the right um, mounted a fundraising campaign with their CSA and local customers to, uh, thank you, um, to buy a barn on uh, land that they're leasing from the Sonoma County Agricultural and Open Space District um, with a medium term lease, not as long as we'd like. You know, I, um, I addressed a room full of land trust professionals a few years ago here in California. And I, I may ask them, how many of you lease land to farmers? And many raise their hands. How many of you do long-term leases, like over 10 years? No hands. How about five years? Two hands. How about three years? Maybe three hands. So we're not seeing yet the long-term commitment by even these organizations that are dedicated to long-term land stewardship. We're, we're, there, are, there are reasons and barriers to being able to have long-term relationships, but we really need to work on this because having a greater stake in the land is how we take care of it. Um, the Javier Zamora right there bought his land um, with the help of a community development financial institution. We can ask our community um, development financial institutions, local banks, um, other lending programs to get creative and think about mortgages to um, working farmers. Um, there's a local farms fund in um, New York in the Hudson Valley that has done um, some really important work thinking about, again, about um, raising local dollars to address the issue of land access for a regional food system. I have lots more examples and ideas um, that maybe we'll talk about in a little while. So, Uh, cooperative ownership is um, something that is just sort of starting to emerge on the scene um, as perhaps a way that um, farmers, by um, putting their resources together, might be able to work um, to access land in a more affordable way. I think we have to be careful about, um, about, ad about addressing the problem from the investor and farmer end because we, also, we, we cannot... Um, forget that there are structural issues that create this affordability problem in the first place. And that's what I want to challenge us all to think about um, is both long-term solutions and creative paths toward land uh, um, ten tenure. So the future of our soil, of our food, and of our rural economies depends on the next generation of farmers and ranchers. These are the producers, the innovators, the business people, the environmental stewards who link us all to the land um, in a basic ecological relationship. So if we continue to be committed to the health of these people, to our landscapes and our democracy, our rural democracy, uh, we have to strive to give farmers and ranchers a greater stake in the land. And we get to talk a lot more about the way that Eric and Stuart are supporting that as well. So thank you so much, Kendra, and as you, as you can tell, she's an absolute wealth of knowledge in these kinds of things. And the most important kind of bullets that I would highlight from her talk is long-term leases, long-term leases, how to move towards uh, worker co-op ownerships in land trusts, and the new land trust succession issue. 
that um, she spoke about with reference to Good Humas Farm in Yolo County. So I now have the honor to bring up Eric Mathis, and Eric Mathis is going to uh, basically tell us all about the, if I can read it, uh, the emerging regenerative economy. So put your seat belts on, here's Eric. Thank you, Thea. And I just want to say how humbled I am to be here, to be on a plenary. Um, don't let the suit fool you. Um, normally the, uh, the attire that I wear um, is shorts, dirty hands, and sticking my finger in soils. Um, but I, I'm a 15-year veteran of sustainability, regenerative development um, from North Carolina, uh, regional trailer park trash. Um, and kind of lifted myself up, uh, stumbled into being in coal country uh, for almost 10 years, uh, developing what I, we many of us refer to as climate change 2.0. And what that is, is not just pushing for a cap and trade bill, but we are uh, looking to develop economic diversification in the heart of coal country and throughout central Appalachia to address uh, diversifying the tax base as well as the voting constituency, which was kind of a blind area of climate change when I first stepped into the scene. So I'm happy to say that climate change 2.0 is quickly going viral with uh, three plus billion dollars of impact investment going into uh, entrepreneurship around um, uh, regenerative agriculture, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm here, I usually leverage uh, these uh, types of presentations for announcing different iterations of work that myself and my team are working on. And going back to the relational component is I'm quickly moving into interfaith and inner spiritual dialogue, um, which I think is kind of the primary um, kind of regenerative uh, mode for uh, linking a lot of things that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to go through these initial slides fairly quickly. The main download is these are process architectures and there's thousands of them out there. Um, and basically they act as kind of like my own personal mandala that I meditate on uh, before I go off into communities and organize them and organize various financial engineering, et cetera, et cetera, to build what I hope to be an emerging uh, regenerative economy. So I um, wanted to start this off. I will read this to you because I like saying it out loud. The only difference between the soul and uh, the soil is you and I. Um, and that's one thing that I want to contemplate on running through these fairly quickly is um, yesterday some folks were talking about reductionism and everything, and I think that we're moving more towards complex adaptive systems, nonlinearity, et cetera, et cetera. And it's these same processes that make up the architecture of soil. And not only the architectures of soil, our own cognitive architecture, and what I'll get into is the cosmic architecture. So, so these are just real quick. I'm sure every, every one of you know about mycorrhizal fungi, uh, rhizomatic architectures, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of my philosophical work um, is informed by um, a new field of thought around new materialism, Gilles Deleuze, et cetera, et cetera. He is one of the uh, uh, philosophers that kind of spurred or connected the rhizomatic architecture to political theory. Um, and cognitive architecture, I'm presently at the European Graduate School um, doing uh, architectural theory and primarily praxis, as I said before, I like getting my hands dirty, less of this and more of this. Um, and these are, um, what I'm wanting to do is basically um, synthesize the way that we think about things in terms of logos and Sophia, which is, uh, of course, wisdom. Um, there's a lot of these processes. This is the back end architecture of a lot of things that makes this conference go on. And I'm going to connect these types of architectures to what I, we're doing in North Carolina, throughout the Southeast, and across the country. Um, so, yeah, there's parallel processors, shared memory. Um, these are types of networks. These types of networks are often found in cognitive architecture, soil architectures. Uh, they have modular forms, uh, rhizomatic forms, processing forms. Uh, meshworks, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the network topologies. And I'd like to point everybody, uh, before I go to the next slide, if you haven't already, uh, in terms of uh, mandalas, go and check out what's called the Bolshoi simulation. Um, this it's basically accumulated all the data in terms of identifying the superstructure of the universe, which has very similar structures of the architectures in soil, as well as in our cognitive architecture. So that's kind of the contemplative process. Now what I really like getting into is the action. What are we doing on the ground in North Carolina, throughout the Southeast, and across the country? Um, this quote is taken from a brilliant book by Stephen uh, Strogatz, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. He was one of the forefathers of a uh, new field uh, called synchronization and there's specific architectures uh, that, that we're learning from within that newly emerging field and we're using those architectures to begin a designing cooperative innovation of which I'll point everybody towards a book where some of um, my writings are a part of a chapter that fully explains what, what I mean by cooperative innovation or what most folks, especially over at Berkeley, refer to as um, open innovation. So, wow, that went quick. All right, and I'm done. Um, so the memory, um, you got the Cleveland model, which are anchor institutions, um, hospitals, universities, these things are brilliant historical institutions that have computed over time um, the relationship to the body via health and computed over time in relationship to the way that we cognitively relate to the world. So we link our models directly to these anchor institutions as well as other ones, K through 12 schools. Um, uh, local nonprofits, government organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the control unit, um, and this is by analogy, it's not uh, a, a direct correlation. Um, the control unit is I am the um, principal architect of uh, business development innovation for Cycle Effect Regenerative Ventures. Chris, I warned you, I'm going to call you out. Anybody wants to stand up? Um, anybody wants to know about um, Cycle Effect Regenerative Ventures? It's basically our platform that allows for all the cooperative ecosystems that are developing various technologies, all the way to biofuel technologies, et cetera, or uh, biopharmaceutical technologies. They enter this platform and they, it incentivizes spillover effects between the scientists and the inventors and everything like that. Um, the arithmetic logic unit. Um, so back on, we don't really, uh, at the Institute for Regenerative Design and Innovation, um, which we're, we're presently launching, um, it's connected to several land grant universities throughout the South, and we basically accumulate the previous kind of architectures, processes, strategies, design threats, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of um, 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 navigate spillover effects by establishing peer-to-peer -peer networks between different communities that we're working with, such as K through 12 school teachers that are doing really innovative stuff around you know, science and relating it to soils, and then getting those teachers to connect to other schools. Um, the Sync Co-op, uh, which is a part of a new company we actually just launched last week, Sync uh, Bioresources. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end, but basically um, we're uh, building it around biofuels um, and linking that to industrial hemp, uh, the, the um, oil uh, production per acre is fairly high and there's also other value added components all the way down to um, producing textiles, um, building materials, et cetera, et cetera, that lower the cost to where we can actually remain competitive within the market with existing scale, scale biofuels, but we're doing it more distributed. Um, and then the Health Innovation District, which is basically what I'm here to announce uh, via YouTube, um, is we're... Um, we're uh, based on my work up in central Appalachia uh, and a lot of what we've learned in terms of leveraging federally qualified health centers as anchor institutions and linking them to HUD housing and linking that to community gardens and the folks from uh, low income housing, grow food, and then you link in like uh, diabetes, dining for diabetes programs, et cetera, et cetera. You're developing a very robust 
intentional pipeline of pulling people out of poverty around health and then getting them into workforce development training programs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, the parallel processors, we in North Carolina are working with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Bioenergy Research Initiative. We've launched two pilot programs in Alamance County and Watauga County. Um, Alamance County, I'm really excited about because what we're doing is linking not only biofuels to reduction in carbon, but we're actually linking it to regenerating soils with a cooperative of farmers of growing those oil seed crops, processing it, getting it into um, potentially airmark uh, universities, um, then using the waste oil from that. But the cooperative itself is linked to low-income communities, communities of color, uh, developing a really robust um, workforce development training program um, of previously incarcerated prisoners in Alamance County. Uh, on the Watauga side, there is a trend. Watauga, uh, Boone, North Carolina was one of the first in the country to launch a 100% uh, renewable energy by 2050. And there's 60 plus mun municipalities across the country are doing this. So not many of them, if any, um, actually know what to do. So we're providing teeth to that municipal strategy up in Watauga County so we can scale it at, our, at hopefully the 2018 Energy Summit that was launched by Amory Lovins and a good friend of mine, um, Jed Moody, and hopefully Van, if you're watching, um, you better show up to Van Jones is a longtime mentor of mine that hopefully he will be presenting there as well. Um, future innovation districts is um, hopefully um, planning my roots in Forsyth County um, and uh, developing innovation district up there as well as in West Virginia and hopefully establishing a partnership here in California of which I would love to talk to any of you all about on uh, what we're doing here and developing kind of a national parallel processor. Um, so these are just examples of innovation clusters um, that have similar architectures that I said before. This is an innovation district um, called the Wake Forest um, Corridor um, that I'm hopefully in East Winston moving into. I gravitate uh, to poverty. Um, I feel at home there. Um, and um, here is something that will make no sense to anybody, but what I want to direct you all to is a book that was published last year that uh, started developing a series of chapters that are going to be pu published over the next two to three years, as well as two other books around um, how to do this, the theory behind it. Um, and it's Living Architecture S Systems Group out of the University of Waterloo um, and Riverside Press. And in closing, um, Yeah, um, so the Ag Energy Nexus strategy, I probably got about 30 more seconds, right? Um, Ag uh, Energy Nexus strategy, um, as I was up in coal country, I stumbled upon being a part of the core team that got industrial hemp legalized across the country, jumped over to West Virginia, got it legalized there, jumped down to North Carolina, got it legalized there, and we actually did it right in North Carolina. We moved everything through a farmer's cooperative, so we were leveraging um, farming power, et cetera, et cetera. So now we're incubating these same cooperatives throughout the Southeast and hopefully in partnership with some of our partners here, uh, launching in this similar kind of platform here in California to hof hopefully lead up to uh, launching a full blown regenerative economy in 2018. Um, the other component right now is we stumbled upon this space age technology, literally kind of the uh, smartphone we, um, uh, biofuel uh, refineries. And we're also working on wrapping that uh, biofuel uh, reactor with a biorefinery to where we can actually take uh, waste food from grocery stores. Thank you. Uh, waste food from grocery stores and uh, harvest terpenes, um, other um, biopharmaceutical-based chemical compounds from waste food. And um, yeah, there's so many other layers and everything, but maybe we can answer those through the Q&A. Thank you so much. So in addition to three takeaways that I'll suggest to you, 
the one thing that may not have seemed transparent is the fact that these systems are based on individual initiative, being fired up to be alive, to work in collaboration with everybody in your life. And you decide, you decide, what is the path that I'm gonna take? Where's my power? Where's my weakness? Who can I hang on to and jump with? That kind of thing. So that's, that's really, really important because it's the inverse of the capitalistic system that we have right now. So it's a very healing modality. So just remember that you know your voices when you stand up or your voices when you stand up and your connections are the ones that leave the legacy that we want for our youngers. So three points that I want to elevate from uh, Eric's talk is the diversity of the tax base. I mean, you probably know that uh, you know middle and lower income tax base people are the ones who pay for our government. I mean, all the corporations, they're down to 3%, maybe less. So that's a pretty important issue. So if you're interested in that, have an appetite for that direction, by all means, take it on. The new materials issue, there's a very interesting growth area. And I, 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 I like the parallel processing and the cognitive architecture, but I want everybody to really check out the Boshier simulation uh, superstructure for universes, because after all, we're results of the Big Bang. You know, we might as well bang on, right? So with that, I want to ha I have the opportunity of inviting our third and very important, equally important, uh, my friend, uh, Stuart Valentine, who's now in Michigan, joining us from Michigan. And uh, he is a high net worth investor, manager, and a, uh, a chair of the board of the Fairfield, Iowa Sustainable Living Coalition. And I hear a terrible hum that's making me nervous. And his presentation is the Community Cultural Food Shed Resilience Program. Stuart, welcome. Yes, hi, Theo. And audience, I, I don't know, are people able to hear me all right? Can somebody give me a thumbs up on the panel? Eric, can you give me a thumbs up so you can hear me? Great, all right. I am looking at the panel, not the audience at the moment. Oh, I see myself, okay. Very good. Well, thank you, Theo, for pulling this panel together because in my view, um, I, I really think uh, the local food shed resilience program that Theo and I have been working on now for the last couple of years is one of the most integral and foundational dimensions of securing our democracy going forward. Because the entity that controls the food supply controls the population effectively. And we all have seen the trend towards industrial ag and what it means to our community fabric. And I think there can be no more important investment than to put our attention on restoring soil health, community health around the theme of food production. Uh, I'm coming into this conversation, just a, a very brief backdrop. I live in Fairfield, Iowa. And as you can see on my PowerPoint slide, the, the quote, uh, only a new seed will yield a new crop. Uh, that, was, that came from Maharishi Mahesh Yogi when he came to the state in the late 50s uh, to transcendental meditation. And this, of course, is what we're doing here in this conference. We're exploring ways. Uh, the opening speaker was discussing about how to change our lifestyle, how to change our paradigm. What are the ingredients that go into that? And Fairfield is a very interesting experiment. Uh, the experiment is essentially now 40 years old. And uh, what is that trying to do, Theo? Oh. Um, okay. No, I'll, I'll be indicating to Chris when I want the, the uh, PowerPoint slide change. Okay, so at any rate, uh, just very briefly, this is an experiment in investing primarily in the development of consciousness through group meditation, 
that spawns all the way through to the children based on a new set of principles about integration with the, the totality of life, rather than being stuck in the old modality, which we all grew up in and are still dominantly living in, which is what you might think of as a reductionist mind-based approach to life and living. So how, as Eric was talking about, how do we go from reductionism to adaptive complex systems? Is that just an exercise of left brain thinking or is it something more comprehensive than that? And of course, the experiment of Fairfield is that we need to actually train the mind to think more comprehensively, to integrate the uh, dimension of doing with that of being. So in my you know, journey along the way, I, I take this local food shed resilience as kind of a primary focus. And I engage it through my role as a chair of the board for a nonprofit called the Sustainable Living Coalition, in which we focus on local food shed resilience. Uh, through my educational role as a uh, adjunct faculty at Maharishi University of Management, teaching in the sustainable living uh, department and in the MBA program. And third is my role as an investment advisor and manager focused on the whole domain of socially responsible investing and impact investing with an eye toward transforming finance uh, to develop a more uh, full uh, beneficial outcome than just the singular target of profit. So Eric, you can switch the next slide, please. So I'm gonna focus on three, three elements of this talk. One is to highlight how critical uh, new ownership and governance structures are uh, to uh, securing a healthy land base uh, for our food production system. And one of the themes that occurs throughout the conference, and I certainly heard it from Kendra and Eric this morning, uh, is about how to approach the ownership dilemma. Because the free market as it is operating is producing a very predictable outcome of consolidation of land in ever more large scale farms. That is the nature of the design of capital that we are living within right now. Unfortunately, that con concentration produces uh, a really rather um, bleak landscape. I live in Southeast Iowa. I can see the remnants of the Iowa, the very rich Iowa farm economy of 100 years ago, and I can see where it is today. What's beautiful about the, the opportunity we're in right now is there is enough individuals who lived, you know, who are 80, 90 years old, who remember that time. And those elders are, are very active in commenting on the current economic culture of agribusiness as we know it. So we need to think about designing uh, for a restoration of community vitality and ownership system and structure is vital or key to that. One book that really helped me along the way, I'm sure many of you have read it, was Marjorie Kelly's landmark book titled Owning Our Future. If you haven't uh, picked that up, I recommend it because it, it really takes us into rethinking how we can do ownership. And in my little slice of activity, I play in a board capacity with what's called the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust. Kendra touched on that very importantly. The Land Trust, uh, our view is that it must produce an ownership path for the farmer. We must be able to uh, reward the very real hard work that goes on with farming with an ownership uh, end game. So these temporary structures are not going to produce the lasting sustainability that we need. And the land trust, in my view, is the best structure I know of that can actually provide for affordability, accessibility, and preservation of farmland. It also is critical that we build on our national network of education uh, programs surrounding farmer, um, new farmers coming in who have the skill set farm regeneratively, who understand soil biology. Um, we've been able to launch at Maharishi University of Management under the directorship of a gentleman named Dr. Timalaya, 
a certification program in regenerative organic and biodynamic agriculture. It's the first year of the program, but the idea is to work collaborative, collaboratively with Sustainable Iowa Land Trust to not only secure the land, but also generate the new uh, farm talent that can come onto the land. There's, there's many programs nationwide. In fact, I imagine in the audience, there's probably at least a dozen programs that are already doing this. And the real important dimension, uh, Eric, you brought up the term meshwork, um, is that we need to act as pollinators in connecting programs so that we quickly find best uh, in class practices, best in class organizational structure, and share that with each other to move and optimize this direction towards sustainable farm. Um, so, the uh, actually, Eric, I'm sorry, can you um, go to the next slide, please? The Sky Factory, yes, yeah, Sky Factory's case study. So, as we move from this reductionist into complex adaptive systems or whole systems approach, I wanted to showcase also the role that business needs to start playing in this regard. Here's a picture of the uh, launch in Fairfield, Iowa, of what's called Sky Factory. Sky Factory is a very interesting consensus-based business that uh, produced the solar farm that produces more electricity than they use, so they're net energy positive. And within the Sky Factory business model, they have a farm, a uh, three-acre farm that provides food for the employees. Faith Reeves is the woman who heads up the farm. And the farm is not just, you know, isolated to Sky Factory. It's a teaching, a resource center farm that provides soil analysis and testing, consulting for local area farmers. She has a mineral bank so she can provide products to the farmers who want to head towards transition. So think of this, I, I, en route to Michigan, I drove through uh, the Chicago area and on Interstate 88, there's corporate campus after corporate campus after corporate campus, all with green grass covered with Roundup Ready that costs those companies thousands per year to keep mowed. Well, imagine if the corporate culture shifted a little bit and said, you know, all these grounds that we have in green grass, uh, we shift toward a permaculture style uh, farmstead that provides food for our employees. Okay, one minute, got it. So uh, my point is, is that business is gonna play a very important role in uh, absorbing and creating food production zones on what now is idle land. So the third dimension, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a picture of campus uh, at Maharishi University of Management. The sustainable living building is uh, net energy positive, processes its own water, et cetera. Just to the left is the uh, sustainable uh, living farm where the education process is going on. Uh, next slide, please. So, in order to get into the investment side, the flow of capital needs to be re redirected. And in the idea here is um, a new set of principles guiding that capital. Are we at the, the slide that says new principles and circuitry, Chris? Yes. Okay. Here's the idea. The current system of, of credit and capital is designed based on a 500-year-old mindset of colonial empire building. We need to actually apply design principles to capital itself. And we believe that the best place to start is using biomimicry principles. So we've gone down the road of developing these principles, generating uh, material that investment managers can use. And, um, and of course, the final one, think, yeah, okay, time is up. Next slide, please, job back. Uh, this is going to be the key element. Chris uh, discussed, or Eric, you mentioned the cell phone. Social networking and crowdfunding techniques uh, 
all of us need to be looking for ways where we can be part of the solution by directing our investment capital through crowdfunding type panels into regenerative agriculture. Next slide, please. Uh, also, we need to rethink uh, philanthropy because philanthropy is, is playing an important role and can play a more impactful role. Uh, this book I co-authored with Stephen Loving will be out within uh, two weeks that will go into the design framework for redirecting capital for higher impact. And finally, next slide. Can, uh, this is a model that actually uh, describes how we can go about deploying this consciousness exercise into our own life in directing capital into the various branches of what we call the growing green economy. Impact investing, organic agriculture, renewable energy, community investing, community banking. Uh, so with that, I will leave, um, I will wrap that up. So thanks for, for listening and I hope uh, we end up making more connections as a result of this. So thank you so much, Stuart, for that. Just recapping, it's land trust, land trust, particularly community land trust in which the community owns 51% and the farmers own 49%. Farmer ownership, absolutely critical. Uh, biomimicry investing and the ways to transition to whole community involvement. In other words, it's time to aggregate, brothers and sisters. So I just want to um, ask the panel, do you have questions for each other or shall we open it up to the wisdom of the room? No, it's up to you. Do you have a burning question for, for us or for Stuart? Maybe, maybe for Stuart okay. and for everybody else. Okay. Um, one thing that resonated to me, Stuart, during your presentation is you are linking design strategies directly to financial modeling and everything like that. And um, as a backdrop using biomimicry, that resonates beautifully um, in terms of what I believe um, a lot of folks need to uh, open up to more market-based strategies and those, it's those types. So can you point towards one or two or just one really, really potent one for the audience to walk away with? Well, I would say that uh, the, the principles of ethical biomimicry finance, as we call it, are laid out. We work very closely with Janine Benyus of the Biomimicry Institute on developing that. And the book I profiled, The Nature of Investment, Investing, with Catherine Collins, who wrote the, the book, is helping to educate what those patterns and what those principles are, but that the investment manager, in crafting a business plan and an investment uh, model, can begin to measure what we call multiple beneficial outcome of a given investment that is under consideration. And now, Eric, you're, you're fully doing this in the kind of investment you're up to, but how can we help capital market players identify those companies that are, are based on that framework versus those that have a singular profit outcome as their design principle? So thank, thank you, this Stuart. is growing a new class Okay. of investment managers who look at the market through a different pair of glasses. It's not a simple quick fix. Yeah, great, Stuart. Thank you so much. I also want to um, open up to um, just slow money and direct relationship-driven investing. I am a slow money investor. I have 17 infrastructure investments with based on relationships. Ain't easy, brothers and sisters, but it's real. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up to the audience. If you would be so kind as to come with any questions you have for any of these really remarkable presenters to that mic, uh, you will be heard by Stuart as well as those of us here. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's yeah. Dana Smirin, and I'm lucky enough to live between here and South Africa um, and have done so for 30 plus years. Um, and there's some fantastic models that I always find in the US, but in the South, we're designing out of a different driver and necessity. 
um, drought, poverty, um, townships, um, lack of education, and I see lots of correlations. In my past, um, one of my past worlds is I used to help do fundraising around corridors of land for migration of African animals and the Mesoamerican corridor and thinking along those lines. And I'm feeling if we look five, ten years ahead, we're in gear, this is rolling. Are you looking at setting up corridors so that we can avoid some of these BT shifts um, and perhaps if you could speak to that, because I'm seeing on the map a lot of clusters and that we're um, working reactively where we can embrace bringing in some of the players. But for us, what we're doing in South Africa is we're really trying to do corridors so that the spray of gases or fumigation is not hitting certain land masses because I live on a biodynamic farm just outside Cape Town and we, we suffer um, because of the spraying of all the vineyards around us. So if we can just talk to the future and what we're doing around corridors. Thank you. The short answer for us is uh, yes. So if you look on the map of North, North Carolina, uh, Watauga County is linked directly to Forsyth County and then Greensboro, then Alamance County, then um, Duke uh, or Durham which is the Research Triangle Park, which was the premier innovation district through the Brookings in Institute report that came out three years ago, so yes. Uh, but our broader, the, the, the report that we're gonna be releasing in a couple of months uh, through NC State University in collaboration with some of our partners here in California um, is developing a bioregional approach, so it's very bottom up. And, also, for those of you familiar with park service uh, activities, um, the park service is very proactive in buying uh, corridors and creating, you know, freeway underpasses, overpasses for animals where highways intersect their their habitats. And they basically plan far ahead. So if a piece of land becomes available and it's right where they want it, I mean, they are like ready, they have the fund. And so A, support the part service. B, biomimic their investing habits with reference to corridors. That's a great question and I think a great challenge also for us to in thinking about the design of these systems that are integrated to challenge uh, both um, nonprofit land trusts that are doing their land acquisition strategies as well as government um, and regional partnerships that we're seeing emerge more and more with local governments working with other local governments to think on a larger scale about the importance of those kinds of corridors. So I think the um, nonprofit sector um, driven by individual, um, you know, we look at um, waterfowl, um, corridors um, on the rice fields that my husband's working with or um, the importance of, um, it, well, waterways in general are the quintessential corridor, aren't they? Um, and then um, the blueprint projects that various local governments are working on to think about these together. How do we get all these voices at the table at the same time and how do we um, hear them all? Um, it's a good challenge. Could I, I just uh, say one brief point about this, which is this illustrates a really critical paradigm shift that as the investor, the investor historically has been looking for a single outcome, profit, financial gain. But you know what we might uh, think is now transitioning that to think, am I investing in the enhancement of life? And what is the dimension of the impact of my investment? Investing for enhancing life includes profit, but it includes many other dimensions alongside it. Yes, and um, if anyone wants to know how the basis on which I make my investments, I'd be happy to share it with you. But there was something Stuart didn't get to say, and so I'm going to put that out there because this is really critical for middle America, and that is that you know, the, the, the soy and corn lands, you know, extend off to the edge of the river. In other words, there's no, no buffer zone there. So what Susan Aram, the executive director of SILT, the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust, presented at the Land for Good um, 
Changing Lands, Changing Hands conference, which was the one that, the first one that, the first activity that has addressed succession for farmers in the United States as, an, as a national issue. Um, she said that you, I'll just, I'll hold it up. <laughs> Actually, that slide is in my PowerPoint, Theo. Know, if Chris, if you wanted to scroll on through it, the this last is. slide in the PowerPoint. So, Stuart, if I may, I'm just going to grab it. Um, so basically, you have a river. You have fruit trees planted next to the river. You have your produce crops next to that. You have a little house for the farmer to live. And the benefits to the corn and soy guy is that, A, he gets a beautiful view shed. B, you know, he may have participation in the product and in, in the money from the thing. And C, if he ever wants to sell it, Boy, has he increased his property value and he gets a tax credit. So, you know, we've got some strategies coming up for, you know, converting the prairie back to fecund land. So, other questions, please? Do we have any more questions? One more Hi, my name is Ariel Aronson Eves, and I'm a farmer turned seminarian. And I was a little late, but I walked in when Eric was talking about the role of spirituality and religion in climate change 3.0. Um, and I come to go to farmer conferences or things like this, and there's this definite presence of spirituality. And I go into a lot of churches and religious spaces, and there's a definitive lack of ecological awareness. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on what you see as the role of religion and how we might be able to shift those religious institutions to be aware of their role in this. Well, um, upon leaving coal country um, and exhausting myself and collapsing to the point of going into the hospital, I had a spiritual awakening about two years ago. Um, my lineage is Christian, um, so I'm going back to my home and entering these institutions that ran me away from that. And, and what I learned from coal country, and this gets into your question and everything, is when I went into it and people were dropping in bombs or racists or et cetera, et cetera, I didn't speak truth to power to those moments because there was a bigger issue in terms of climate change and saving humanity and et cetera, et cetera. So going into the, those conversations, uh, both within Baptist churches, you know, Pentecostal, et cetera, et cetera, with an open mind, knowing that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear things that I don't agree with, but trying to find those things that you do agree with, similar to the architecture that I was talking about. But more than that, uh, what we're doing in some of these innovation quarters, it's about enriching really dense networks. It's about unitive intelligence, not artificial intelligence. So um, uh, developing interfaith dialogue between, so we're, the uh, Stuart used the uh, tree of life. There's an actual tree of life called Moranga that we're planting in uh, a impoverished community and bringing, um, yeah, um, Moringa, sorry, um, bringing several religions um, coming in as an act to plant that and everything. So, yeah, we're out of time. Does that make? Uh, I have a, a comment on that, if I could. Yeah, our time, um, our time is what up, you're Stuart. Speaking so. to, what, what I think uh, you're speaking to is really quite critical for all of us as individuals, uh, those of us who are involved in church uh, type of communities, to make the distinction between what you might think of as received religion, right, where you un no questioning, you receive the religious doctrine, versus uh, giving life to contextual theology, where you are the living exponent of life, and and as such, making that. Um, generating that communication about the vitality of life, that the contrast is so clear what you spoke to of feeling a spiritual living moment versus a dogmatic or um, doctrine-based received theology. So we have to, as individuals, model within our religious institutions what it is to be a living 
spiritual being versus a passive recipient of received religion. Ho! Oh. So thank you all so much for the opportunity. So Os Osprey is going to come up and uh, do our next panel, and I'm going to move this podium for her. Uh, but you know, if I can just say, we're, this is all being live streamed, so it would be really appreciated if you would get it out to your friends. You know, send emails, Twitter, uh, whatever you can to um, get folks watching it, because we're hoping that this will be seen by many more people than just who's here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. So uh, welcome, everyone, to the plenary on reclaiming our democracy, resistance, and renewal. I want to hear everybody say resistance and renewal. Ready? Resistance and renewal. We need that as we're fighting for our democracy in this country. My name is Osprey Oriel Lake and I am the executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network and I also work with the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature and we have a star here on stage with us who's going to teach us everything. Do you want to say hi and say good morning? Hi, say hi baby. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so our future generations mean everything to us. I'm really glad that you're here with us. Um, I'm about to introduce the panelists. I'm just here to moderate, but I wanted to kind of contextualize uh, this particular plenary. Uh, earlier this year when the Soil Not Oil Steering Committee met, it was right after uh, the election of uh, the new uh, administration, I'll just put it that way. And we were all really reeling from the election results, as I'm sure many of you um, were. And so, you know, what did this mean for our diverse movements and our advocacy efforts? And so this is one of the reasons we wanted to have um, this session during the conference because, you know, the question is really how do we continue our work if we don't have a functioning democracy? And we think it's really vital for all of the work that's going on around food sovereignty, carbon sequestration in soils, fighting against GMOs, protecting indigenous rights, and all of these issues that are so core to us. So how do we reclaim and renew our democracy, I think is a really important conversation that we're gonna have this morning. And um, you know, what are we gonna do in this political environment and how are we going to address our governance structure so that at minimum, we really have an opportunity to fight for justice and the well-being of people and planet. And uh, clearly we have a long ways to go. So I'm very excited about this conversation with these really awesome leaders so we can really have a robust conversation with all of you about this critical juncture in our country and how we're going to really be dealing with this oppressive government now that we're many months in. 
And I think we're, we're looking at this in the face of climate catastrophes. We all know what's going on right now with our sisters and brothers um, in Houston and in Florida. And of course, all over the world, we're seeing massive uh, flooding and fires. And you know, we, we need to be addressing these issues. But to do that, we need to have our democracy. Um, we also know that we have issues of patriarchy, neoliberal capitalism, white supremacy, environmental racism. All of these things are pressing in on our communities and of course the list goes on. And since the Women's March um, at the beginning of the year in Washington DC protesting the election of Donald Trump, I, as you know it was the largest march in US history which I think it's really amazing to remember what women are doing and how central they are to these issues. Um, since then, I don't know about all of you, but pretty much every week there's another protest that we're asked to go out on the streets for all these incredible assaults that are happening that really require us to do ever more. And you know, how are we all staying balanced in the midst of this? Is, is, it is a challenge. But I am very hopeful in the sense of seeing so many more people awakened and active than we've ever seen. And as so many frontline communities have told us, you know, for them, a lot of things actually haven't changed in this new administration. They were already facing all of these issues beforehand. So now we have the opportunity to have so many more people engaged and we need to do so. Because we are, you know, in my book, in the fight for our lives, literally. So uh, this is going to require a lot of strategic planning over the next years, a lot of solidarity and action between different groups. We really need to work in different sectors and not be in our silos and connect in ways we never have. Um, and uh, in this context, I'm really honored to, to open up this conversation with these, this outstanding panel so we can really learn from the roadmaps that they have been exploring in reclaiming our democracy and give us um, a deeper analysis of this political moment um, and how we can organize and so much more. So with that, I'll start uh, on the end there with uh, Sharon Lungo. She's the executive director of the Ruckus Society and she's been a trainer with them since 2001 and she's a founding member of the Indigenous People's Power Project um, and is on the advisory board and a key member of the Ruckus staff since 2007. Sharon has an unwavering commitment to holding a racial justice analysis within nonviolent direct action organizing and implementation and has extensive experience working with grassroots frontline communities and big NGOs alike and the scope of her more than 18 years of political and nonviolent direct action experience range from local to national to international. And she is the daughter of migrant parents from the Pipil Nation who are indigenous peoples of El Salvador. So let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for being with us, Sharon. And next to Sharon is Ruchi Shroff. She is the director of Navdanya International, which um, is now based in Rome, Italy, which is the international arm of Navdanya, which, as probably many of you know, is Vanda Nishiva's uh, founding organization. Um, and we were so honored to have Vanda here several nights ago. It's an uh, organization headquartered in India, which has been working for over 30 years towards the uh, conservation and re rejuvenation of agrobiodiversity, traditional knowledge, and a transition towards a food system that ensures ecological sustainability, climate resilience, health and nutrition, equity, and social justice. Uh, Ruchi coordinates the international programs and campaigns related to seed freedom. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that program. And food sovereignty as well as resistance to GMOs and free trade agreements. She has worked for over a decade with social movements in the defense and protection of the environment as well as democratic rights of minorities and indigenous communities. Let's go ahead and welcome Ruchi. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, sitting next to me, I'm very honored to introduce Drew Dellinger. He is an internationally known speaker, writer, poet, and teacher who has lectured and taught extensively across the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. He is the author of the award-winning poetry collection, Love Letter to the Milky Way, and the upcoming book, Martin Luther King, Ecological Thinker Toward a Cosmology of Connection. Drew has lectured and taught at numerous colleges and universities, and he has been called a national treasure by Joanna Macy, a deep and courageous poet by Alice Walker, and one of the most creative, courageous, and prophetic voices of the generation by Cornell West. So let's give Drew a big hand. Welcome all of you.
So with that, I'm gonna jump into our first question for, for our speakers, which is, in the work that you're doing, what does resistance to this political moment look like, and what analysis and actions can you offer us? And I'm gonna just start right here on the end with Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Um, thanks, everybody. So, um, yeah, again, my name is Sharon, and I work with the Rucka Society. <clears throat> um, so you all can imagine, right, that we're not the only ones that are kind of shaking in our boots and asking ourselves, you know, what do we do at this time, and how do we respond to crisis that continues to unfold every day, right, every day, something new. and. Um, direct action is not new for our communities. Direct action is something we say we've been taking on since 1492, since colonizers landed here on these lands, right? Our own people here in Huchin, the Oholoni people, you know, are, are resisting and taking action on a daily basis to defend their homelands, um, to remind us, you know, that we're living on stolen land. Um, <clears throat> You know, but, I, but I'd say the movement right now is we're asking ourselves a lot of questions and uh, asking ourselves how do we take the tactics and the strategies that we know and apply them to what is happening at this time, right? How do we apply the strategies and the tactics that we have to supporting our brothers and sisters in Texas who are going to have to be dealing with the aftermath of Harvey, you know? And, you know, just want to lift up that after Katrina, organizing communities and communities in, engaged in direct action uh, formed the Common Ground Collective and went out to, you know, went out to New Orleans to help the community rebuild. And that's one way that we can apply our skills and the, the strategies and the tools that we've learned um, in direct action towards directly supporting our communities. Um, but I'd say it's a time really to be thinking about multi-pronged strategies. You know, and we're watching, we're watching the work that we've done over years and years and decades and decades just be stripped away, you know, with the stroke of a pen um, or with someone's decision. You know, we, we hear about how, uh, how in Texas, right, environmental regulations were relaxed right before Harvey. And now we're seeing, you know, chemical plants explode and we're seeing, we're going to see the aftermath and effects that are going to last for decades and possibly centuries in our communities. I know you have a lot to say, don't you? Um, <clears throat> You know, but there's a lot of forms and ways to, um, to use direct action. I just want to lift up a couple of examples. I just want to lift up a couple of examples. Um, so, you know, one thing, one thing in particular with indigenous communities, but also other communities, you know, is harnessing the power of our culture and traditional ways. So lifting up the Unistotin clan of the Wet'suwet'en nation up in northern British Columbia, right, who are building traditional homes and gardens and community directly in the path of TransCanada, Enbridge, and Chevron. Right, who are reclaiming their home territory in a traditional way, who are exercising their traditional values and knowledge and beliefs to, you know, to resist a pipeline that's coming their way. You know, go farther south and we see, uh, we see that they're building tiny houses right in the way of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Not exactly a traditional form of building or, or, or you know, a traditional house, but an adaptation of that concept, right? And let's, let's put homes, let's put things that people actually need in the path of these pipelines, right? How do we actually, how do we actually fulfill our needs while resisting, you know, major corporations that are coming to, to take our land away? Um, you know, we're seeing a rising response to fascism and white supremacy, right? And are taking our skills to the streets to fight the Klan and to fight the fascists who are coming into our communities who have been really emboldened by 45 and his policies, right? Um, and we're seeing people do direct interventions, right? And so we're, we're seeing people all over the South take down statues, right? And doing direct interventions to take these horrible symbols of racism you know, out of our people's way so that we don't have to be reminded on a daily basis of, of the foundations of this country and everything that we're fighting for. But also using that in a symbolic nature, you know, just last week, um, the organization Mi Gente made a mock statue of Jeff Sessions, uh, it took it to DC and then, you know, pulled this mock statue down, you know, a very, very symbolic way of kind of extending, yeah, <clears throat> let's take Jeff Sessions down, right? Not just symbolically, but literally, right? And just to show him that that's what we're planning to do, right? We're here to take you down. And so we're gonna show you how to do it. Um, you know, and, and what we're seeing is, is the rise of grassroots communities taking those kinds of actions. Uh, we just finished up a training in Portland with a community organization called OPAL, Organizing People, Advancing Leaders, 
um, who are talking about how to use direct action in a place of resiliency um, and how to not just fight off the fascists who are calling for white supremacist rallies in their communities this weekend, um, but how do we take the skills and the leadership that we've instilled in our people and that our people you know, have intrinsically um, and take that and not just fight the fascists with it, but take it, take it to a place of you know, how do, how do we claim space for our community? How do we claim land for our community? How do we start to build the things, the future that we want to see, right? Uh, more and more our communities, our communities are saying, and you know, Wet'suwet'en and those nations are a prime example of this, that we can't wait for other people, that it's up to us at this time to build the future that we want. You know, just here locally, Occupy the Farm, the guild track, right? That's an example, right? Like, yeah, props. Props to everybody in this room, you know, that's been out to the guild track and was, was a part of that, right? That's an example of our community wanting to take back land, you know, that doesn't need to be manipulated, that doesn't need to hurt, doesn't need to be hurt, that's stolen land, right? And put something good there, put something that's going to feed our community, that's going to nurture our community, and that's going to develop our community. You know, that's another application of direct action in a time like this, and another way that, you know, we're bringing our democracy back to ourselves. Um, also wanted to lift up direct actions that, you know, point out the intersectionality of our issues. So a couple of years ago, a young brother in San Francisco named Alex Nieto was murdered by the San Francisco PD for eating a burrito on a hill, right? Because, you know, a gentrifier called the police on him because how dare you be a brown person eating a burrito on a hill near a white person's home, right? And so when folks decided to take this issue to the streets, uh, not only did they want to hold the police accountable, but they wanted to lift up the issue of gentrification and tie gentrification directly to police violence. Tie gentrification to the violence in our communities. Tie it to environmental justice issues. And so, you know, folks took over the street in front of the Mission Police Station um, and they stopped a Google bus, you know, that was picking people up for work. Um, they set up a mock trial against these police officers, but they also lifted up all of the issues that are happening in San Francisco that are directly related to this police violence that, you know, that are, that are the root causes um, of this kind of violence. Um, you know, so, so really this is the time to apply everything that we know and everything that we've learned to everything that's happening, right? Because every day we're in crisis, every day something new is changing every day, something that we've worked really hard for is being taken from us. And I can't underscore enough that direct action is nothing without organizing, right? Without the daily work of all of our organizers and the daily work of each of you talking to your neighbors, talking about racism, talking about environmental justice, you know, talking about social justice, you know, having that conversation and building power in our communities is what's fundamental to making direct action work. Right, direct action can serve a purpose for direct intervention, right? We want to take down these statues so these symbols of racism don't exist. But direct action can also help us reclaim land. Direct action can also help us to remind people of the kind of society that we want to live in. You know, and just, and just to lift up, you know, we, we throw the word democracy around a lot, um, but there are a lot of different kinds of ways that people in our societies live, and a lot of different ways that communities choose to govern themselves. Um, you know, and, and part of all this is respecting the autonomy of our communities, respecting traditional forms of governance, uh, you know, traditional ceremonies and traditional ways of thinking and, and reclaiming some of that thought and apply towards the modern day, right? Nobody's saying we're going to go back to living those old ways. You know, we, we like our modern conveniences and, you know, we like our technology and I'm not going to lie, I like Facebook, right? <laughs> but, you know, within that we can find ways to to live this life without hurting each other. You know, so, so you know, just, just a prop in advance to all the people that are gonna go out and help in the recovery efforts towards all the crisis that's happening right now, right? All, all the excess of water that's hitting our communities in the same way that a lack of water is affecting our communities. Um, and, and all the skills, everything that we've learned, you know, through direct action, through organizing, that's all gonna be applicable now at this time. Um, <clears throat> you know, so, so really what our communities are talking about is like, you know, we've been putting the pedal to the metal, but, you know, we got to crank up the gas a little bit, you know, and maybe that's a bad metaphor. We're talking about gas and all that, but that's what came to mind. We're going to pedal the bike faster. How's that? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so, you know, at, at this time, I think what our communities are calling for is, is diverse strategies, you know, is, is more organizing and, and a call to really uh, force ourselves to apply the things that we want and really, really vision, not just vision the future, but put that future into action. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, uh, Osprey, and all of you for inviting me here. Um, you're so right. Every passing day, the, there is a new crisis. And the interconnected nature of the multiple crises that we face is also becoming clearer and clearer. So the ecological crisis, the social and political crisis, as well as the economic crisis. The ecological crisis is very evident, it's already here. We are seeing the devastation already with the hurricanes here. In India and in South Asia, uh, the flooding recently has killed over 1,200 people and displaced millions, which has not made as many headlines. Um, there is a deep, deep, deep agrarian crisis um, in all of South Asia once again. And you would have heard of the farmer suicides, over 320,000 farmers committing suicide over the last 10 years. So. That is one aspect of the ecological and the agricultural crisis, and then the political and the social crisis. Um, we've had in India over the last three years now, not just an authoritarian government, a far-right authoritarian government, but far-right extremism now slowly becoming a mass movement. Just four days ago, um, a very senior journalist was shot and killed right outside her home for expressing views against the government. This is the fourth such murder of intellectuals, writers, journalists in the last period itself. And this was followed by widespread celebration of and, and a warning by not just the state and its supporters, but also MPs saying that if you dissent, if you speak against the state, we will come after you. Up till now, we were living with threats, and now there is direct violence happening. This is coupled with mob lynchings against the Muslim community, against Dalits, uh, against the minority communities for their eating habits, for their cultural habits, for their economic activities. Um, there is a complete takeover of almost every institution in Indian society right now, be it the university, the media. Surprisingly here, even the New York Times suddenly gets a spine when it has to, uh, is able to criticize Trump. But we are, most of the mainstream media has either uh, colluded with the government or is terrorized into submission. Um, universities, schools changing their history textbooks, um, students not able to uh, express themselves freely, there is severe clampdown. So we are really in a fight uh, for our life as far as democracy is concerned in India. And with a sort of a poison that is already penetrating society. So the kind of actions that we will need to look at, there is a resistance, there is a resistance, and I'll come to that in a second too. So I wanted to spend a minute on the aspects of what is also happening in other parts of the world. And then the other dimension of the crisis of democracy is also the corporate, or the, or the corporate agribusiness, or the corporate uh, collusion with authoritarian governments. So if we look at, say for example, in, this, in the space of agribusiness, where now three corporations will control over 60% of our seeds or 70% of our um, agrichemicals. Um, there is, that is also a crisis of our democracy when monopoly control starts to take over our entire food and agricultural systems, where those that need to be regulated start writing our laws. There is a crisis of democracy. So th there are seed laws that are being imposed all over the world. In India, here, I was reading the other day, uh, I think 29 states have, have passed a seed preemption law which will, which will impede counties or local uh, cities to uh, make their own seed laws like GMO bans or seed laws. It's here. In Malawi, in India, laws that are being imposed through either trade agreements or sheer control over government or weak governments that make farmers' seeds illegal. So this in itself is also a crisis of democracy 
when corporate control starts taking over our commons, our resources in the commons, which is our seeds and biodiversity, our water, and our food systems. So as decision making starts getting centralized away from local communities into the hands of national or regional governments, and then ultimately into corporate boardrooms or, or financial institutions, there is a crisis of democracy. So if we look at this fact of democracy, of corporate globalization, which is seen as an aggressive privatization or a takeover of our commons, whether it is land, seed, or, or water, uh, or knowledge, um, um, when communities begin to express their sovereignty and act on that sovereignty, that is the most powerful response to this corporate takeover of this uh, a corporate takeover of our democracies. So, and this is also happening throughout the world, not just in India. Um, whether it is farmers all over the world many parts of the world saying that we will not follow these seed laws that make our seeds illegal. We refuse to follow such laws that make the saving of seed, the breeding of seed, the exchange of seed illegal. That is the big response. Um, our organizations, our communities that are working with us are saving seeds, keeping seeds in farmers' hands. Um, we have about 120 community seed banks where we are saving thousands of varieties of rice and vegetables. We are working towards this mod against rather or getting rid of this model of agriculture that is now, you know, where, see, where, where just three or four giants are, com you know, are producing three commodities and where seed and food is now in their control. We are working towards an agricultural model, working with local communities and villages where seeds, not only seeds are in farmers' hands, but the agriculture that is being practiced is nonviolent in harmony with the nature. That is at the level of community. So these actions are, are, are being created everywhere, not just in India, but everywhere in the world. And communities all over the world, like what Sharon spoke about, in India, communities have fought against big mining companies and won. A recent example is of communities in Orissa, indigenous communities called the Dongria Kon, which fought against the mining uh, 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 company called Vedanta and won. Uh, seven years, communities in another coastal town of Orissa fought against another steel giant from South Korea. Seven years, women and children at the front lines did not allow the company to enter or even put one brick. They finally succeeded in winning. So wherever resources or wherever communities' resources or seed or land or water are being threatened, they are fighting back. And our challenge is how do we join them and how do we connect these various resistances? All right, so these are huge questions and very complicated. And I think we need to be able to think on multiple levels um, in terms of having a long-term, mid-term, and short-term strategy, in terms of having an inside-outside strategy that both works within the electoral process and pressures uh, the electoral process from without. Um, so I think, and I think part of the challenge that we're faced with right now at the moment is to deal with the fact that the status quo prior to 2016 was unacceptable. I mean, it was a social justice nightmare. It was an impending ecological catastrophe. And yet, um, things can get worse. And things did get worse um, in terms of the election of Donald Trump. So I think it's... You know, we can be kind of jaded and be like, oh, well, you know, the, the, there were problems before Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah, there were. And I think we need to recognize what's different about what's happening now. Um, because there's nothing strategic or spiritual or ennobling about denial, about being in denial about the challenges we're facing. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a complicated thing. How do we talk about the new challenges we face with the Trump administration and some of the other dynamics um, that have come along with it during the campaign and since um, without, you know, pretending that 
the electoral process has all the answers or that Democrats are going to be our saviors or that the status quo was acceptable. So I, I think it's hard to even have this conversation. Uh, we're in a ridiculous um, scenario. I mean, there's, a, there's an immense amount of absurdity um, when I feel like I have to get on a stage and hold a microphone and say that Nazism is bad. I mean, this is, we're in a profoundly disorienting moment. And so I just wanted to kind of be real and say it's hard to even begin to frame one's thoughts um, when there's so much that we're dealing with. The general thing that I have been saying for 10, 15, 20 years is that we need to build movements we need to continue to build and strengthen these movements that connect ecology, social justice, and cosmology, or worldview. I think some of you, cosmology is not a super familiar word in general, but I think a lot of you have a sense of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what's the cultural story? What's the narrative? What's the big story? What's the worldview? What are the unquestioned assumptions? that are operating in the culture. And so I think uh, if we look to the roots of uh, these ecological and these social crises, we begin to have, need to ask those questions. What's the worldview? What's, uh, what are some of the deep principles that are operating on a meta level and flowing between these ecological and these social injustices? Um, deep principles such as personhood, reverence, Respect. Are we treating human communities, ecological commu communities, with reverence and respect? Or are we treating them as objects to be exploited, as resources to be commodified, right? So I think there's some deep principles that have to do with our worldview, with our cultural story, with our narrative, with our paradigm, with our cosmo vision, with our cosmology, right? So this is why I include this. Of course we need to integrate ecology and social justice. I think we also have to look at what's the worldview that's operating in the culture. So I say we need to build a movement that connects ecology, social justice, and cosmology or worldview. And we need to build that movement using the powers of dream, the power of story, the power of art, and the power of action. It's very important that we have all of those because when we talk about dream, again, that gets down to the level of cosmology. What's the underlying principle worldview of the culture? Are, you know, how do we even think about uh, our role as human beings on this planet? Are we here to consume? Are we here to compete? Are we here to engage in uh, you know, the maximization of wealth and profit? Or are we here to celebrate? Are we here to commune with each other? Are we here to connect and to be creative? You see, so I think we're in a real, uh, you know, we're in a moment where the cultural story is up for grabs and we all need to be artists and weavers of the new and emerging cultural stories, right? Let me just say that in terms of resistance, so I think uh, in terms of resistance, we need, to, we're also in a powerful moment where we're seeing some very powerful emerging uh, social movements, the movement for black lives. The movement for black lives is the most significant action for racial justice that we've seen in this country in the last 50 years. It's tremendously, tremendously significant. We all need to support this movement. So part of what I think resistance looks like, thank you, in this moment is, um, for white folks to support, to recognize and support the leadership of communities of color. So supporting the movement for black lives, supporting the indigenous leadership that's at the forefront of the climate movement and many other um, struggles. Um, supporting um, you know, the, the, the immigrant red led immigrant rights movements. So um, I think part of what we're figuring out here um, for white folks is how to recognize, support, and be in solidarity with the leadership of communities of color. Um, I think part of resistance in this moment is not normalizing what's going on. Um, I think uh, we have to, you know, I think we have to strike a balance between not creating fear and panic and negativity and yet also being real about the, the danger that we're in. I don't know that it serves us necessarily to be in denial about the danger that we're in, but right now we have an incompetent, uh, unstable, vindictive, uh, racist, white supremacist, uh, Nazi-tinged president who has, you know, the capability to launch uh, nuclear weapons. 
So I think we need to be real about that. We need to look at the fact that the presidency of the United States is essentially a nuclear monarchy over the planet. And do we want to continue to have this kind of situation where one person, um, em empowered by a completely um, corrupt political party, um, is essentially a, a nuclear monarch uh, with destructive potential uh, over the entire planet. I think we need to look at the challenges to democracy that the Republican Party and the Trump administration face. This is not to tr paper over the sins or inadequacies of the Democratic Party, but I think we have to be real about the political dynamics. We need to recognize that we have uh, a um, completely unethical political party that will put um, you know, the fate of the planet in the hands of a corrupt, incompetent con man like Donald Trump. I think this is one of the most uh, embarrassing things and one of the most potentially destructive things that's ever happened in the history of American democracy um, in the modern period. Um, so I think we need to, um, I think part of resistance look at, uh, looks like pushing for impeachment. I think part of resistance looks like registering voters in massive numbers. I still don't think that we've built on the left a culture of voter registration. Again, that seems like maybe not as exciting as, you know, shutting something down in the streets with a direct action protest. Um, but I think we need to look at uh, the, import the significance of winning elections. This was an imminently winnable election. There's no reason why we need to, to let Republicans back into the White House. And when we look at the appointment of Neil Gorsuch, and if we contemplate that Donald Trump could potentially be appointing one or even two more Supreme Court justices, um, that has a dramatic effect on one third of the U.S. government for the foreseeable future. And then we could work really hard and elect a progressive president, and that president could have all of her or his uh, policy proposals um, dismantled by a completely extremist right-wing Supreme Court. So I think we have to be strategic. We have to be smart. Part of what we're doing, if we're talking about the electoral side of change, and I think uh, you know social transformation goes way beyond electoral politics, but if we're looking Looking at the electoral side, you know, we've got to get the House and the Congress, I mean, and the Senate and the uh, presidency and the Supreme Court to even begin to have a chance of, of changing the status quo toward the direction of ecological survivability and something that looks a lot more like social justice, right? So, you know, uh, it was a lost opportunity in 2016 to take the White House and we could end it, and it could lead to more lost opportunities down the road uh, if we think of having a Supreme Court dominated by two or, or, or one or two more Trump appointees. So I think progressives, liberals, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to say liberals, progressives, radicals, the left, revolutionaries, we have to get much smarter and much more unified in terms of coalition building so that we can do uh, massive pressure in the courts, in the streets, uh, and in the ballot box, because I think all of those are part of the, the transformation that we need. We're not going to make it without a massive movement. Electoral politics are part of the puzzle, but we're going to need a massive movement. We're going to need a massive movement just to keep uh, having a chance in electoral politics. You see, the voter suppression, I think we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment, so I'll save some of my comments on voter suppression, but we've got to be very strategic and very savvy. The voter suppression. This was the first presidential election since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in the uh, 2013 deci decision, Shelby County versus Holder. So, and, and we've got this uh, Republican led gerrymandering, right? We've got this partisan political gerrymandering. We've got the voter suppression. We've got the purging of the voter rolls. So we've got these immense challenges, even if we just want to have a chance to, to, to be uh, on equal footing. Um, in terms of the electoral process. So I think we have to have a clear-eyed recognition of what I call Republican ruthlessness. There's a ruthlessness gap. There's a ruthlessness gap. Now I'm not saying that people on the left or that Democrats or progressives have to be ruthless, but they have to understand Republican ruthlessness. And we have to begin asking the question, what would Republicans do in this situation? And we have to understand that we're going to have to up our level of commitment and our level of uh, steadfastness if we're going to be able to compete in the electoral process. So I think we've got significant challenges. I think we need to have a multi-level inside and outside strategy. I think we need to uh, resist in the courts, in the streets, 
in the ballot box, in our hearts, and in our imaginations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all very much. Really powerful comments. Um, and we're going to do another round of questions uh, to the panelists. And um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, in agreement with everyone that has spoken is that I think one of the th things that is being asked of us right now, all of us in this room, all of our colleagues, allies, friends, family, is that no matter what we're doing, we need to engage in our democracy more. As an example, the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, uh, we obviously are focused on, on climate change and specifically you know, working with grassroots, indigenous and frontline women. And this year, we've really changed a lot of our programming to ensure that democracy has been part of the conversation and offering different trainings around that topic. And I think we all feel extremely full and busy and sometimes overwhelmed with the work we're already doing. But I think that as you can hear from the speakers and you know from your own life and just you know, looking at the news every day, that we all need to engage if we're going to have a change in our democracy and to really reclaim um, what we've already lost and to go forward in this very imperfect moment in this crisis in our country and in, in uh, democracies around the world. So I think what's being asked of us is more engagement than we've ever seen before and how we're going to include uh, um, our engagement in this political process because we cannot stay on the sidelines. Just pretty much everything's at stake. So with that, we're going to do another uh, round of questions and then hopefully we'll have some time to open it up to, to all of you for comments or questions you have for the panelists. But uh, the second part, we really want to talk about, you know, what does it mean to reclaim our democracy? We really see that, you know, we're in a moment of resistance, which is really key. You know, I've been in dialogue with a lot of our partners in other countries and the first thing they said, you know, right after the election was, the first thing you have to do is resist and not normalize the situation. You need to jump right on it. And uh, we found that to be true. So that word resistance means a lot. Um, and, and then what does reclaiming our democracy mean now? What do we really need to do going forward? And I'd love to hear from the panelists, you know, your analysis, thoughts, and actions on that. Thank you so much to hear back from you, Jerome. Um, so I'm thinking about an alliance that was formed uh, right after 45 was elected called the It Takes Roots Alliance. Um, and this alliance is made up of the Climate Justice Alliance, which is over 50 groups, the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, which also represents another 40 social justice and uh, racial justice uh, organizations, the Right to the City Alliance, which is made up of housing justice organizations, and the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, representing over 55 indigenous communities um, in Turtle Island, M many, many more. Um, just more recently, um, you know, and, and conversations started to happen in this alliance about, you know, what does unified but diverse strategy look like, right? I think at first it was like, we got to unify, we got to unify, and, you know, there's got to be one pathway that we're all going. And I think the more uh, our communities talked and the more we surveyed our organizations and the folks in there, you know, folks had a lot of different answers um, for what we were doing and invited us to think of multiple strategies and to start to act on those strategies. They also invited us to not just focus on the national stage, but to really go back and invest in our local communities and take that training, take the strategies, take everything we know, take the resources and reinvest them in our communities because that's what they've been asking of us all this time. Um, you know, our folks in the Malcolm X grassroots movement and our brothers and sisters at Co-op Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, right, did a lot of work to elect Chekwe Lumumba, right, a black nationalist, you know, into the political arena. And we know that that has white supremacists shaking in their boots. And we love it. I love the idea of a black nationalist, you know, in power alongside of a community that is claiming their sovereignty, that is, you know, claiming land alongside of indigenous people for black people, right, recognizing the interrelationships of our community, the history of uh, our oppression and, you know, the way that the man has impacted all of us. Um, and so calling us to think, you know, beyond, beyond the normal strategies that we're thinking of, but embracing things like actually putting up some of our people, you know, into the political arena and lifting them up and, you know, st starting to put our people out there to be elected into these positions to influence change. Because as much as we hate the inner workings of the government, 
you know, that's, that's where the laws are being made. That's where the regulations are changing. And it has to be our people on the inside as well as on the outside to make those things happen, you know? So the vast response from our communities in this alliance was, you know, we're gonna keep grinding here at home. And we want you to look at the national stage, uh, but we also want you to look at the international arena as well and go out into the world and learn from different communities and bring those strategies back home, you know? So, I, you know, I just wanted to lift up that alliance at this time is really looking at multi-pronged strategies, looking at things from the local all the way up to the international, entertaining strategies, you know, like putting our people um, into office, taking on new ways of organizing, and then holding strong to, to our roots and everything we know about how to build power in our communities. So, Reclaiming democracy, um, I think as our crises, or whether it's the political or the ecological, uh, the increasing tendency that we sometimes see that as it gets worse, um, there's also an urge among people to address the immediate or the fragmented reactions at the cost of longer term system solution or you know, looking at the root causes. So if we look at sometimes, say for example, the climate or the ecological crisis, um, many times it's presented as just a technical problem that can be fixed within this system uh, through technological innovation or uh, unleashing the magic of the market, you know? And, and, and we see that the same forces or the same dominant economic forces or the same large corporations that have brought us this crisis in the first place, um, enter through the back door, offering us solutions to the crisis and using or seizing this opportunity to once again make profits. So when we look at the crisis in, in fragments, we, we fall prey to the same false solutions and opening the doors to the same entities that brought us here in the first place. So if we, the, the, the response um, or an adequate response would be that we will need to address all of these dimensions together, which means if we were to look at the issues of climate and food and agriculture, we need to remember that without seed freedom or seed sovereignty, we cannot have food sovereignty. Without keeping seeds in farmers' hands, we cannot respond adequately to the climate crisis. Farmers cannot respond to the climate crisis. Um, and the alternative that is needed is not just at the level of tools, but what Drew was saying at the level of paradigm, at the level of worldview. So, and we are not gonna have any miracle or silver bullet solutions. Every time we do that, we will keep coming back. We are not gonna find the solution. So if you look at that aspect. The other aspect when we look at uh, reclaiming democracy across all of these aspects is the never separating the ecological from the social. Um, one is the ecological aspect, if we look at the ecological roots of some of the violent conflicts yeah, that we see today, one aspect is that. So whether it is Punjab in the 1980s, or Syria, or Nigeria, a large number of conflicts originate in the destruction of the lands, the soils, the water, and the inability of the land to provide further livelihoods. The UNCCD uh, last year said that over the last 60 years, 40% of the conf intrastate conflicts originated in the destruction of the land and the takeover of the resources like uh, land and water. So that aspect of seeing not just the ecological context, but also the social context of these crises. And how do we come out of this violent cycle? We come up, one way is to deepen the very democracy, which means to bring decisions that directly affect people's lives as close, to, as, close as possible to where they are, where they can take, where they have the power to decide, but where they can also take responsibility. So if a river is flowing through some communities, it's those communities who should have the power and the responsibility to decide how to use that water. 
And so communities taking back the sovereignty over these resources. And finally, um, so when, uh, we need to bring a diversity of voices and opinions when we talk about our movement. There is more than one answer to the multiple crises that we talk about. So we need to bring more and more people to the table. And as we shape this movement, we need to also examine or reflect whose voices are being heard. Thank you. Thank you. So, keep going. so in terms of what does it look like to reclaim our democracy in this moment, I think I, I touched on some of the things. I think we need to restore the Voting Rights Act. I think that's very important. Um, it's not glamorous to have to refight uh, the struggle um, that, our, that our foremothers and forefathers fought uh, in Selma and elsewhere and throughout the South, but I think it's tremendously important. I think um, <clears throat> the Republican Party has shown that they're committed to disenfranchising as many voters as possible, particularly communities of color and working communities and poor communities, so I think we need to have a massive movement for voting rights. We have to have a massive movement against voter suppression. We have to have a massive movement against these, this ger gerrymandering, against the voting restrictions. Um, again, this is why the Supreme Court is so important. There were these um, voting restrictions that North Carolina had put in place um, that were struck down when the Supreme Court tied at 4-4 because uh, Scalia died and there were only eight justices on the court when the case came up. They tied 4-4 and that's what enabled um, the lower court decision to stand, which had struck down those North Carolina voting restrictions. But now we got Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, right? So we cannot count on that happening in the future. In fact, it may be carte blanche for all of the voting uh, restrictions that they want to try to push through and to have them all rubber stamped by the Supreme Court. So I think we need to be very aware of what's happening in terms of voting rights and we need to have a massive movement for voting rights and against voting suppression. I think uh, pushing for impeachment is an important part of reclaiming democracy in our time. Uh, I, w I felt that we needed a massive movement to ensure that there was an independent investigation. I think now that we have uh, special counsel uh, Bob Mueller on the job, um, we need to be prepared for the fact that um, we could have an instant constitutional crisis any day if, uh, if Donald Trump uh, fires Bob Mueller. It's a little more complicated than that. He would have to ask uh, Assistant uh, Deputy uh, Attorney General Rosenstein to fire. Rosenstein would probably resign, then they would turn, then the next person would probably resign. You get the point. But if that general move happens where if Trump tries to fire Bob Mueller or does fire Bob Mueller, I think we have an instant constitutional crisis on our hands and we need to get in the streets and be prepared to have direct, direct action strategies. I think this is the kind of thing that we need to get more um, savvy and strategic about. How could five million people shut down Washington, D.C. if we had uh, a constitutional crisis um, resulting from the firing of Bob Mueller? Um, I think we have somebody, we've handed our democracy, and, and believe me, again, this is part of the thing, it's not like I thought our democracy was just going along peachy keen and just fine beforehand. So we need, you know, we need, it's not like everybody was, you know, just misty-eyed at how perfect our democracy was before Trump was elected. And at the same time, we need to recognize that we have handed our democracy to a person who has stated publicly that he may not accept the results of uh, an election in which he is not victorious. So, you know, is that uh, uh, possibly an unlikely scenario? I don't know. I'm just saying the, precaution, the political precautionary principle uh, necessitates that we need to be prepared um, to face down these challenges to democracy and the rule of law uh, in the courts and in the streets and in the voting booth. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for a few questions or, yeah, just, we have 10 minutes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for those really important comments. Um, we definitely could take a question or two. Does someone, okay, we have someone standing there. Please go ahead. Maybe you could state your name as well. Thank you very much. I'm Richard. Thank you. Okay. I'm Richard Page. A wise old white man once said nothing. 
please help me understand as I record more and more progressive meetings where white men are not allowed a voice, at least until everyone else has spoken. How may I ally with you and make sure that men don't take up all the space with talking like I am right now and still be at service, please? Who'd like to take that? I think it's 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 a sense it's a sensitive topic, I guess. Um, I think it has to do with. Um, I don't think anybody is saying don't ever say anything if you're a white man. We, you know, um, it's much more about um, emotional, social, and political awareness, and recognizing that we as white men. We as straight men, we as cis men, we, um, et cetera, et cetera, have been at the center for so long. Um, and it's not, and that we need to rejoin the community of voices, that we are one voice amongst many, and that, what, you know, white supremacy, white perspective, um, white, it, it's, it's really easy to take these things out of context in the sense that you see something on Twitter. And uh, you know, somebody, a white man, states an opinion, and then somebody says, "Oh, well, the last person I need to hear from about this is a white man." And then the white man gets his feelings hurt, and he says, "Oh, what? I can't have an opinion because I'm a white man." And it's like, no, it's not. It's beyond the context of this one little interaction. No one's saying you can't have an opinion if you're a white man. You have to take it within the context of decades and decades and decades and centuries and centuries and centuries of it always being white men having an opinion on everything and that opinion being valued above everybody else's and them deciding that they need to have and they need to come in and we need to tell you and please, you. it's just too much. And so when you have had decades and centuries of that, and then somebody, and then you say, well, here's my opinion. It says, yeah, I don't, actually don't need to hear from a white man on that. You need to take it beyond the personal. You need to take it beyond your hurt feelings. And you need to say, this is about centuries and centuries of white men's voices and lives and everything else being valued to the exclusion of other voices. And so this is part of where a systemic approach um, to history and to institutionalize and systemic white supremacy and male supremacy and these types of things can help us get over our hurt feelings and say, yeah, maybe we don't need to hear from endless, endless white men about about every topic all the time to the exclusion of all other voices. We're moving much more toward a democratization of voices, I think. Um, actually, the women requested that he respond because a lot also what happens in these conversations is that uh, people of color, in this case women of color, are being demanded to respond. And they're saying, uh-uh, you guys do your own work. So in all due respect, I'll pass on to the next question. Please. Hi, um, I'm Lisa, Lisa Milos, and um, I wanted to say also it's not only white men, but also white women. Uh, Donald Trump won with 54% of the vote of white women in this country. Um, so we also need to look at that, even within the feminist movement as well. And I think a lot of the, the impetus bet, uh, regarding the 2016 election had to do also with the fact that we as progressives or leftists are always looking at what benefits us internally in terms of our own domestic policy, but we don't take responsibility for how this affects everywhere else in the world. And uh, with, uh, even within democratic presidency, presidents, uh, we've had major devastation and with the free trade policies and everything like that. So that is something we really need to address and I'm glad that some of it was being addressed here as well. One of the other things that I wanted to say is that one of the ways that white people can be, well, everyone in particular, but in specifically white people and the economic power that white people wage in this country is very important. And the divestment movement is something, a very concrete way that we can literally um, use our economic power to benefit the emerging and the social movements 
We need anybody who is in this room right now who still has a bank account at Wells Fargo, Citibank, Bank of America, needs to get out their money out now. Anybody in this b room that has a pension plan that is investing in uh, energy transfer partners or any other fossil fuel industries and who also has their uh, money invested in Citibank uh, and all those different things, of course many of us don't have a choice because we're not even represented in the pension plans, but we need to move the money out of there. That's we need to really put our money where our mouth is. And great, that's great, great comments. I just today, wanted to if you had a, I just wanted today, to know if you had a question for the panel. Okay, I just wanted great. to ask yeah. the panel if, um, and, and basically the, uh, the, um, whether or not the, the event today called stopetp.org is going to be also replicated here in a, in a significant way where we can participate in that national movement to stop energy transfer partners.org by joining together and making a public statement regarding divestment and 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 uh, and in stopping energy transfer partners because the the way that the people in Standing Rock the water protectors were treated uh, and which today continue to face um, criminal penalties um, no, so I'm sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to, we have such limited time. Thank you. It's a really good point. For those of you who are not aware, Energy Transfer Partner was one of the main companies behind the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so there's uh, a big action today on that. And I'm going to hand this to Sharon, but let's get one more question too. If we could get a question, that would be super. Thank you. Could you say your name? Yeah, really quick. How you doing? How is everybody doing? My name is Vernon Haney. Welcome. Great panel. And um, no worries. Thanks. Yeah, and I was just wondering, um, first of all, my question is, with activism, I heard that you say, like, you know, they're taking back the land, using some old tactics, like building houses right in that access to those pipelines. Now, I'm new to activism or just activating, you know, so there's a lot of fear of me being a black man because I don't want to wind up shot, dead, or anything else. I would like to see, like, how do you, like, put that fear out of the way to take small steps increasing you know and to join bigger movements and i would also like to say you know with all people in here first of all i heard yesterday there's not much difference in all of us we're all humans but you know there are ways that you can support groups without even opening your mouth like me being in a group of a mixed group makes me feel more comfortable in my activism sometimes because i'm like oh they won't hurt these people they'll help us now, I don't know if that's like a resonated feeling, but it comes off like that sometimes to me. So I'm just wanting some information. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll speak to both of those questions and then hand it over. And I'm just going to ask Osprey to keep an eye on my child over there. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, you know, yes to the tip on divestment and divesting our money. Um, you know, I think when our grassroots movements started to talk about divestment and the divest strategy, and that became a popular strategy among uh, larger NGOs, you know, some of the big greens like 350.org, our community said, well, what about reinvestment? When you divest that money, where does that money go? Right? Is that going to go into some other kind of funky, fake, clean energy project? Or is it going to get reinvested into our community so our communities can decide how we want to power our communities? Right? So I, I wanted to lift that side of the divestment strategy up, that it's not just about taking our money out, but it's about where our money goes in its place, right? <clears throat> um, and then, yeah, you know, like shout out to the day of action around uh, energy transfer partners. Some of our relatives were just out in Dallas, you know, demonstrating and um, there's a large coalition that's forming around that, and so I'm sure that we'll be seeing a lot more, and there's a lot more interest around holding energy transfer partners accountable, uh, not just for Standing Rock, but for all of its other evils. Um, and then to the young brother, you know, um, you know, thanks for just expressing that uh, vulnerability and that honesty. And you know, the truth is, I want to keep you out of jail too. You know, I don't want you in there. I don't want more of our brothers in there because part of what we're fighting is the prison industrial pipeline, right? That's one of the biggest injustices we're facing now, right, is our young black and brown people, you know, getting flooded into the system for just being themselves, right, for crossing the street, you know, for reaching for their own cell phone, they're getting shot. Um, 
you know, and, and we're talking about diverse strategies and how people of all walks of life can step up and support our communities. Um, you know, and it's, it's two roads, I'd say. It's really important for us as black and brown people to step up and express our own truth and be in leadership of direct action. Um, but in the Ruckus Society, we teach, um, uh, you know, we teach uh, layered strategy and Wow, the term is not uh, is not coming to me. Oh, it's, it's we call it stacking risk, and that means that there are some people that have more privilege and that can go through the prison system, or you know, will be dealt with by police differently than some of our folks. And some of those folks choose to step up and leverage their privilege and take risk on behalf of our communities. Here in the Bay Area, we see that a lot with Black Lives Matter and uh, an affinity group that was formed called BASAT of white folks, you know, who went and shut down the Oakland Police Department because black activists asked them to do that. You know, and so, you know, it's two different strategies because as a brown person, I don't necessarily want white people stepping up for me all of the time. Because I do think it is my responsibility, you know, to represent my people, to represent my issues, to represent my community. And it's extra important that our people speak for ourselves and that we not give our voice up to other people. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be the ones who have to go to jail all the time or that that's the strategy that we're trying to use all the time, right? It's not about leveraging civil disobedience so that our people can go to jail. We're actually trying to keep our people out of the system. But sometimes we have to leverage our risk in ways that are really uncomfortable, right? And, you know, now we're seeing elders and disabled people, right, step into direct action and, you know, put themselves in really awful, vulnerable positions, you know, to, to leverage support for all of us. Um, you know, so, so I'd say that this is a larger conversation that has to happen and is happening in our communities. Is what does risk look like in our communities? What does it look like for us to step up on behalf of ourselves? And how do we ask folks with more privilege who are asking and wanting to support us, how do we give them clear direction on how to lift up our issues but not take up that space, you know, that, that is normally taken from us? You know, and it's, it's, a, it's a slippery road. You know, we're still, we're still working it out because in our communities, internalized racism still exists. You know, in our activist communities, issues of oppression and dominance still exist. And, you know, we're still, we're still decolonizing our own minds and our own selves. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I think we're seeing this rolling out into the streets now, you know, where our folks with more privilege are doing that for us, but then our folks who are deeply impacted and directly impacted are those who are speaking voice and speaking truth to power. So just thank you. thank you so much. Let's give a big hand to everyone. And we're really great comments, really important conversation. Thank you, everyone. And let's really keep resisting and renewing. Thank you. Pray, and I would like to remind you that we have outside of this auditorium there is a, a room that is the library room, and there will be a movie playing today that is Abundant Life. The director is there, Natasha Florentino. So you go out and walk at the to the end of the public library, and you will see at the corner an entrance with a little place with trees and, and benches, and at the if you go inside, there will be a glass wall, and inside is the going on the movie. Also, we would like to remind you that we have a lot of squash, and we expect you to help us to take it home. Otherwise, we won't have a, a, a way to take it home ourselves. It's a, a lot of squash. And Mark? And just a reminder that uh, we're live streaming. It's actually soilnotoilcoalition.org is where you want to go, and we're now on both YouTube as well as Facebook streaming. Uh, so tell your friends, and uh, then we're gonna do breakout sessions at this point, and then um, after breakouts, we have a lunch at one, and then at 1.50, we're back in this room to hear the Lieutenant Governor of Vermont. Yes, at at 1.50, the Lieutenant Governor of Vermont is gonna be speaking here, and also we have uh, a couple of plenaries after that. And 
in his, okay, what you want? Okay, also in Facebook you can go to, to our page that is Soul Not All Coalition, and there you can share it with your friends the, the conference online. Thank you so much. So take a squash. Take a squash home with you. Thanks.